All right. Um, I know it's the last day of classes, and the teachers all have papers to raise, so just stick with us for 20 minutes and <laughs> as painless as possible. So, I already stated the title. It's New York City at the Crossroads, the intersection of ecology and lifestyle of very young peers. So, throughout this presentation, we hope to address two major questions. What is the relationship between our lifestyles and our ecosystems? And how have they changed over time? And also, as well as how should they change? So first we want to start with what is Wolikia? Um, well, to answer this question, we have to look back at our professor Eric Sanderson's work with Manahatta. He started this project with the Wildlife Conservation Society um, with the goal of understanding the ecology of Manhattan around 1609, when the Europeans first began to settle there. And Wolikia is the wider project of doing that same research for the outer boroughs of New York. Um, so our capstone, focusing on the distribution of people and their settlements, which is an important part of this reconstruction. The Lenape, also known as the real people, were a native people indigenous to Northeast America, with territories ranging from Pennsylvania to New York. Um, studies suggest that they likely inhabited New York for hundreds of years before the Europeans arrived. Um, the Lenape chose their, the location of their settlements based on natural resources and natural variables such as climate, fresh water sources, food availability, and protection from wind and competing climates. They engaged in localized farming practices called team planting, which consisted of planting crop lands between crops such as maize, beans, and squash, and they also relied heavily on fishing, evidenced by the vast, vast shallow heaps found near the shore. This is a picture of the wigwams that they lived in. Um, uh, they were their mode of shelter, and as you can see, they lived pretty simply. The living groups usually consisted of no more than 150 members, which allowed for a very sustainable way of life. Our specific job in contributing to this project was to find out where Lenape sites and trails used to be. We used various sources, such as archaeological reports, history books, maps, legal documents, and other interesting finds on the internet to get our information. Each group focused on research in different outer boroughs. Some of our most important sources contain archaeological and historical information found in the early 20th century by Arthur Bolton, Allison Skinner, and Clark Whistler. By studying the Lenape sites, we were able to extrapolate information about what the ecology of the Lenape must, of the land must have been like 400 years ago. So we're going to go into the project details here. And in order to gather and compile our data, we use three major data tools. Zotero, which is an online bibliographic tool, giving us the ability to organize and connect information to a source, going as deeply into the source as provided the page number. Spatial data resources, spatial data resources or SDRs, <coughs> enable us to connect the information we retrieve to the bibliographic source. And the place name database, database, which was just an archive of, archive of the information we collected that allowed us to filter the data by site location and site type. So, once we had gathered all our results, we made a map in GIS. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, GIS is short for Geographic Information System, and it's a software that allows you to visualize geographic data from a bird's eye view. Uh, these maps are helpful given the larger goal because they allow for a more cohesive and literal understanding of the ecological and topographical data we found. Uh, and we worked really hard to combine all of our information from the data resources and produced a model of what the various boroughs may have looked like in 1609. So if you look at the map, uh, the polygons represent sort of an estimate of where the Lenape sites were. Um, the circles represent more specific sites, and the green lines represent old Lenape trails. Uh, here's a chart of Lenape settlements um, and where they likely settled in the different boroughs. We defined a major site as a more permanent settlement, settlement while minor sites were usually campsites or temporary fishing grounds. So how has ecology and land use changed since then? Um, as you know, we have completely transformed the natural ecology of New York City. We have fought against the forms and flows of the land to build our city and fit our needs and desires. However, many of these changes may have been hasty and now limit sustainable living, especially given our lifestyles and our growing population. So what we can learn from the Lenape way of life is the ability we have to engage responsibly with our landscape to fit our present and future needs. So how have philosophies changed since the Lenape times? Um, the Lenape philosophy was based on the assumption that nature and humanity were not separate entities, 
They believed in sharing resources, gifts, and labor in exchange for a simple life that emphasized respect, community, and balance. It can be argued that, on the other hand, our modern relationship to man is described by John Locke, pictured here, uh, in 1689 when he wrote, the labor of a man's body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Whatsoever then he removes out of the state that nature hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with and joined to it something that is his own, and thereby makes it his property. In other words, our philosophy seems to stem from the idea that land is something we can assert ourselves upon and own permanently just by interacting with it. And then we tend to pass on ownership of the land through generations. Uh, and the Lenape do not really understand this way of thinking. So why should we look to the past in the Lenape way of life? Um, mainly because our current way of life is premised on an outdated assumption of unlimited natural resources that is no longer sustainable and uh, understanding our original ecology can help us restore parts of the city to a more natural and sustainable state, one that will ultimately protect us. Um, here is a painting of the Lenape Indians making a land agreement with the European. Um, and based on the different philosophies I just described, it can be said that perhaps the Lenape did not have the same understanding of the treaty uh, that the Europeans had. So um, during the uh, next few weeks of the Capstone Project, we employed a variety of sources to analyze the current trends of American energy infrastructure. Uh, we looked at historical behavioral data over 100 years, as well as current patterns of energy behavior of Americans and New Yorkers, just to see how we got to the point where we are now in terms of energy use and fossil fuel resources. Um, oil, tremendous power in the oil facilitates our daily lives. Oil facilitates cars, and cars facilitate suburban regions. Uh, this power over carbon-based non-renewable resources uh, took over 100 million years for uh, nature to create, and only about 100 years for man to extract. This power helped us transform our lives and redistribute our populations transcontinentally all across the United States, first into city centers and then outside of them into suburban regions. Today, approximately 70% of the oil we use uh, oil that we extract is used for transport, commercial transport, and heating. About 30% of that is used to refine the original 70. Oil refining relies on a fossil fuel burning distillation process, which separates crude oil into component hydrocarbon fractions. Uh, in turn, the different hydrocarbon fractions are then separated based on their oxygen rating into jet fuel, kerosene, uh, gasoline, uh, heating oil, and then other industrial petroleum products. So alongside the technological improvements of the refining process came the innovations behind the internal combustion engine. In the 1830s, steel and railroad companies relied heavily on coal to power their locomotives. Uh, during a short time period of about 25 years in the 1880s, uh, streetcars, which were powered by electricity, were very largely popular in, New York, in the New York City area. Ultimately, the city streetcars were taken over by gasoline internal combustion engines of the automobiles such as the Ford Model T. And so the shift toward gasoline engines really could not have come at a better time. Uh, the cheap oil window, um, highlighted here in the blue, where uh, the dark line represents the inflation adjusted price of gasoline over 100 years, was a 40 year time frame that followed the discovery of massive oil fields in Texas, such as the Black Giant. Uh, the four decade long time period was really enough for the American economy to become rather addicted to the energy density of petroleum. Uh, cheap oil prices influenced by massive supply of oil uh, provided a window where manufacturers and refiners could really turn a profit in selling oil and Americans could use it on a daily basis in their average lives. Uh, this is a rep representation of what we actually do with our oil. It is a BMT graph that shows the uh, total vehicle miles traveled in the United States over the past 100 years. The y-axis represents trillions, uh, trillions of miles traveled. Um, as you can see, we drove a lot in the 20s, 40s, 50s, but even more so into the 20th century, uh, despite the fact that we had economic turmoil and political turmoil, such as 9-11 attacks, the Gulf War, um, and other economic situations. We kept driving. And so um, the highest point occurred in 2005 with over three, three trillion vehicle miles traveled. 
Today, an average American drives slightly less, at about 12,000 miles annually, and in parallel construction of roads and highways, federally funded and subsidized by the U.S. government, uh, created a networking system that requires now most Americans to drive to work. So the three trillion miles per year actually take us to the suburbs. Here, the great American expansion took place from 1940 to 1960. The fact is that around 6% of population in 1900 live in the suburbs. And around 100 years later, 46% of population live in suburbs, which is approximately 172 million of people. Then here is a figure that shows the Great American Expansion from 1947. <coughs> the progress of American Expansion, and we can see the area in the light blue shows the area inhabited back to the 1940s. And then as time went down, people moved outward to take up more spaces in the dark blue and black. Here's another figure shows the population of Manhattan in the Bronx from 1790 to 2010. Um, you can see the y-axis is the uh, number of population through the time. And the dark blue line shows the population of Manhattan. And the light blue line shows the population of Bronx. Um, we can see as the streetcar invented, um, more people, um, more people moved to the Bronx and outward, and as more people can have the opportunity to own the car, and people also move like outward. But there is also some. Outside of the density, mm, comparing to the average American, actually the workers have less carbon footprint. Mm, since the transportation distance is shorter for us, for example, like New York City has very extensive train system, um, which is basically like a big carpool. And moreover, like many of us, we live in apartments. <coughs> Um, in New York City, so like New Yorkers also take up like less spaces. Um, if we're comparing from the Manhattan period to the present, uh, we can like summarize in five aspects to show the lifestyles have changed a lot, including housing, transportation, food, waste, and energy. The first one is about housing. Um, we first see the left one is a very typical and not living spaces. It's called weak one. Um, it's built up with organic material and it takes up very little spaces. And the right one is a very common American house in the suburb. And usually the garage and the backyard will take a lot of space. And the last one in the middle is the average worker, it's the complex buildings. Since most of the New York buildings are building upward, actually to save a lot of spaces. Yeah, so for transportation, the Lenape practically did it the best because all they had to do was walk everywhere. And then if they wanted to travel up and down the street, they just took their canoe. Whereas us today, we're major gas guzzlers since we use the car. But cities sit along the middle because at least we have things like um, buses and trains, which, like Sabrina said, act as a major carpool. Um, so for food, the Lenape used sustainable farming methods that did minimal damage to the land, as well as collected shellfish and hunted for whatever they needed. We, on the other hand, rely on a small percentage of the population that's involved in industrial farming to export food to us through planes and trucks, which also release greenhouse gases. And then if you're in the suburbs, you have to add to that the drive to the supermarket. Um, as for waste consumption, the Lenape didn't really produce excess waste. Um, everything could just return to the land and biodegrade, so they didn't really have to worry about products from today, like plastics and uh, nuclear waste. And another factor we have to take into consideration is just that 
our population today was nowhere near the number that we had back then. So already our impact is going to be exaggerated. When it comes to energy, the Lenape's footprint is little to nothing. Uh, we today are on the other extreme since we rely on oil for practically everything um, from turning on the lights to big industrial processes, basically everything. Um, cities sit um, somewhere in the middle because of the things that we mentioned before, like mass transit. Um, so we do do things today that do lessen our impact, um, like internalizing the externalities. For example, in California, um, the cost of making plastic bags from oil is now added on to the consumer. Uh, we already have streetcars, bikes, bike lanes, buses, and pedestrian zones across the U.S., but we can definitely add to that. And then as for green energy, we have a long way to go. The percent of green energy, um, like from solar, uh, geothermal, wind, is nowhere um, where it could be. So until then, um, until we put in the changes on a large scale, our greenhouse gas emissions are just going to keep adding to more devastating effects, uh, more devastating events like sea level rise, loss of biodiversity, and much more. Um, the picture on the bottom left was taken during Hurricane Sandy, which resulted in 43 deaths in New York City. More than 300,000 housing units were destroyed or damaged. And on the top right is a picture from one of our snowstorms, which you can clearly see had a an obvious impact on the above ground transit systems, which takes time to be fixed. So basically, this all just goes to show that our current habits aren't sustainable, and if we don't do something to change it, there's going to be consequences. Uh, so the future of Manhattan. Uh, we spent the entire semester investigating Manhattan in the past and in the present, so now what? What can we do with this knowledge to make a more sustainable future? Uh, we have come to understand that 400 years from 1609 is driven by the availability of resources. However, with our continued, develop, uh, continued dependence on oil, cars, and suburbs, these available resources will no longer become available to us. As a result, we must shift away from, the current, from our current patterns of resource consumption. We have made steps towards a more sustainable future by using Dr. Sanderson's website, manahata2409.org. This website allows users to create their own idea of what Manhattan should look like in order to be a more, more sustainable. This picture is the initial screen you'll be prompted with to create your new vision. You can title it however you want and create a vision for whatever year in the future. The program displays several ecological parameters. And at the bottom of this initial screen, you can choose from different metrics of the environment. You can click for Manhattan 1609, which is mainly forest, to Manhattan 2009, the offices we see today. The website also allows for people to modify these factors, as you can see in this bar um, on the far left-hand side. Um, clicking on these icons, icons can add solar panels, water treatment plants, streetcars, and much more which gives individuals a voice in what they feel needs to be done to create a more sustainable Manhattan that they want to live in for the future. Now, the interface. You can also choose from five different lifestyles. A Lenape person, an average New Yorker, an average American, an eco-hipster, and an average Earthling. Not only can you change lifestyle, but you can also change your visions of climate and the ecosystem. You can track environmental performance of these four factors, comparing how your vision matches to the environmental performance in 1609 to, and to 2010. You can further show inputs of and outputs of each indicator so that you can see the breakdown of where the water is coming from or the breakdown of food and energy usage and compare it to today and 1609 thus allowing the user to see if their changes have improved sustainability and they can make direct changes to a particular indicator they're interested in. So here's a vision of the ecosystems of Minnehaha 1609 with the Lenape, when the Lenape were living here. This is what Manhattan looks like in 2009. So the different colors represent the different parameters. The pinks and purples are residentials and business buildings. The orange, yellow, orange and yellow are streets and sidewalks. 
and the blue and green is the natural features like forests, lawns, and ponds. So we use this to make a vision, just looking into the future uh, for the wow. 2015. And so as you can see in this vision, there's more green space. There's also all the translucent looking buildings have green roofs on them. There are fewer roads. We replace those with pedestrian footpaths. And there's more uh, bike lanes and I think I had a subway line. And so what you can do after you make a vision is you can look at your environmental performance. And this measure, you can see water, carbon, biodiversity, and population. And you can see also the little sticks there, uh, which shows you the green one is 1609 Manhattan. The uh, sort of dark gray one is 2010 Manhattan. And then the one, your vision, is the orange line. So you can see this vision had somewhat less stormwater runoff and had, or compared to 2010 at least, also compared to 2010, it had more biodiversity and a lot more population. Also, it had higher carbon emissions, but if you look at per capita carbon emissions, you can see that this vision had a lot lower per capita carbon emissions just due to the fact that so many people. And so this is just a, another way to demonstrate how increasing the density that people live at can be uh, more sustainable in terms of emissions. We also created a vision of Manhattan based off the way that the Lenape lived. Uh, you can see it's mostly forests. There's not very many buildings. If you look at the environmental parameters, there's, I mean, a lot of biodiversity, a lot less carbon emissions, but the population is very low. This isn't really uh, something realistic. This is just to show uh, how it would have looked if it was mostly Lenape. Um, to make a more realistic vision, what we did is we took the uh, just changed the lifestyles. We, uh, the, the default lifestyle that all the other ones were using was average New Yorker. For this one, we changed it to eco hipster. And so as you can see by doing that, uh, greenhouse gases goes uh, below Manhattan. And so that shows you how changing lifestyles can, uh, can have a pretty significant impact on the sustainability of the city. So conclusions that can be drawn from this study. Uh, well, we need to plan in more sustainable ways. That's clear. Um, but there's also different ways by which Manhattan can be made more sustainable. Uh, you can focus on changing ecosystems and lifestyles. We've seen how the ecosystem that uh, certain people live in is going to be a determinant of their lifestyle. And so one of the major uh, ideas that we got from using the Manhattan website is that we need to have some degree of balance between 1609 and 2009. Uh, we probably can't go back to the way things were in 1609. That's not realistic. But certain ideas about land use from 1609 are a lot more sustainable than what we have going on in 2009. So certain aspects of the way that the Lenape lived, like their um, way that they uh, traveled, they didn't use cars. I mean, they, they didn't mix it, have public transportation, but they had you know the commutes and stuff was similar, and they walked more. And so basically, we need to incorporate some of their philosophy into our lifestyle and have that also inform the types of infrastructure that we plan to build in our cities in the future. So these are just the sources that we use. You can see it's heavily informed by the works of our professor, Eric Sanderson, who we'd like to thank for his help with our capstone project.